OK, why don't we go ahead and start back up again? Um, there's one question just about the examples. Um, some people have asked about corresponding state of code and someone wrote that they didn't see any state of code or data for example three. So Pedro, I wonder if you could touch on that. You're, you're muted, Pedro. Yeah. Part of my life. I have heard this phrase so often. Yeah. <laughs> can you repeat the can, can you repeat the question again? Yeah, a couple of people just asked about corresponding state of code for the examples, and they and someone mentioned that they didn't see any state of code or data for example three in the posted material. So I just wondered if you could um, expand yes. on that. So for example three is the is the part of the combining like multi period target driven adoption with the sensitivity analysis. I don't have that case working out yet in the status. There is no package, there is no package implementation for that just yet. That's why the code is lagging behind for that version. Because I mean, I, it's not possible to run that example just yet. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Cool. So we are, yeah, I think we are good on time. And it's more or less how I predicted things to go, like two hours for the basics and ship things around that. And now we are like in this world when I do have variation treatment timing, right? So units now, now we are not going to be constrained in the two periods case and two groups case. We're going to be in a situation where I have several time periods, right? And units, when I say units here, you can think about individuals, can be about firms, states, you name it. They're going to enroll in treatment in different points in time, right? They're going to enact the policy in different points in time. And it's very, very tempting for us in that situation, right? To kind of like rely on, on like jump ahead and extrapolate from our basic implementation of, of different different from before using two affix effects regression to this slightly more general situation. Because now what, instead of having this treatment like group dummy, I'm gonna have unit fix effects, right? And then it's, oh, unit fix effects is more general. So it's capturing all unit specific time invariant shocks that can affect the outcome. And this is, now that I have several time periods, right? Instead of having a post-treatment dummy only, I'm gonna have time fix effects alpha T. And this time fix effect are supposed to capture shocks that affect all units in similar way. And instead of having the interaction of treatment and group and post, I'm gonna have this dummy variable here, DIT, that takes value one if a unit is treated by period t, t and zero otherwise. And here I'm going to focus on the case when once treatment is on, it stays on, right? So once it's on, it's forever on. So DIT is going to turn on for different units in different points in time. And once it turns on, switch from zero to one, it's going to remain one forever. So it's very tempting. And for many years we have we have done this actually, like we we extrapolate from the intuition of the two by two different diff to this the intuition here on this like more general setup when I have several time periods and I have variation treatment timing. And I interpret, I use we use to interpret beta here as an average treatment effect of this. Well, the bad news, the good and bad news is that in the last five years or so, we have gained a lot more understanding of what's going on in this type of regressions. Right? What do I mean by that? So this regression has a single beta. Beta is constant for everyone, right? So if you do not believe that every single unit have the same effect as other units, right? So me, me and Paul may have different treatment, treatment reactions to the same like policy. Me and Brady may have different reactions to the same treatment. If you are if you're embracing heterogeneity from the very beginning, right, this single beta here does not uncover an easy to interpret causal parameter of interest when I have heterogeneity and treatment effect dynamics. So the question that many researchers have asked is like, what is beta? What is going on in this beta? How can I interpret this beta? And this is a question that like several researchers have like asked in a very similar point in time, right? So Boris Yakjaravel, Deshaies Martin and Dufay, Goodman Bacon, Athey and Evans, all tackle these type of questions. And the overall message over here is that when triple effect heterogeneous, 
right? Beta from two affix effects regressions like this do not uncover an easy to interpret parameter interest. And in fact, this is going to be a weighted average of causal effects, but some of these weights are negative or can be negative. And negative weights are the worst type of weights you can come up with in this type of situation, because even when treatment is positive for everybody in the population, it is still possible we get a beta that is negative. There is this no, if I have negative weights, I do not have this no, like no sign, sign preservation property, right? No sign reversal property. And that's a no-go from a causal difference perspective. And because of this kind of like, well, everybody who does diff and diff until five years ago, use this type of regressions. And these regressions are not really reliable, right? Because I'm not, I'm interpreting this result quote unquote, not appropriately. But that kind of like shake a bit the literature on diff and diff and different papers have different explanations. So far, the most popular explanation is the one given by Andrew Goodman Bacon, right? His paper is, has around 3000 citations right now. So it's a very popular explanation. So I, we're gonna go and dig into his explanation, like to explain how this problem of negative weights appears how we can actually answer what kind of question beta is actually, what kind of policy parameter be, beta is recovering. Um, Pedro, sorry to interrupt, just a couple of questions about the model specification here. Um, do we need to include time fixed effects in addition to fixed effects for treatment timing in the regression? I do not, the answer is I do not know, right? So, I mean, my, I suspect that this is a time fixed effect, right? I mean, yeah, I, I think you do. I'm not sure, right? Everything that I'm gonna be saying today now is gonna rely on having this specification, right? I have to do some like simulations checks like to see if instead of having time fixed effects, I have treatment time fixed effect, if that changes or not. It may not change, right? But I'm not sure. You, do, you, you for sure do not need unit fixed effects. If you have like group, treatment timing group fixed effects, that works. That is for sure, that I know, right? So you can replace this alpha i for treatment group dummies, right? That's still gonna work. The alpha t, I'm not, I have to play around a bit more. Okay, and then um, one more follow-up question about the model specification here. Um, can you clarify whether when you say treatment effect heterogeneity, you are referring to heterogeneity across treated units or heterogeneity across treatment time? So for example, dynamic effects over time. So I am re I'm referring to both at the same time, right? So here, the, if I have heterogeneous time trends, right? This is gonna be, I mean, so each unit has, I mean, I have, I, let's put this way. I do have dynamics, right? And these dynamics are potentially heterogeneous across groups. If that's the case, this is very bad. If I have dynamics, there is constant across cohorts, or so they all evolve similarly. This particular specification is still problematic, but then you can bypass this specification using event set specification that's gonna solve some of these problems. But the worst case scenario, it is, dynamics with heterogeneous trends. So this is like potentially what's going on over here. Right, so, and the idea is like, why we are doing this? I mean, essentially because it's very tempting for us. Like we have seen the two by two case, we started from this, beta actually recovered an ATT. And I mean, if anything, this second specification over here, it is more general than the above one. Because I'm dropping group dummies to unit fixed effects, it sounds much more general. I'm dropping time the post treatment dummies to time fixed effects. It does sound much more general. And this interaction now is going to be like taking value one if I am in post treatment period and value zero otherwise. It's kind of preserving the same specification. Here I'm going to have this variable now gi, which denotes the time a unit is first exposed to treatment. Right, so GI here is like, if I am first exposed to treatment period two, GI is equals to two. If I am first exposed to treatment period 10, 
GI is equals to 10. If I am never exposed to a treatment, GI is going to remain equals to infinity. Right? So that's the idea over here. And for simplicity, and I'm, we're going to focus that once treatment is on, it remains on. Right? Say, ah, oh, Pedro, but my treatment turns on and turn off. Well, you can always recast a problem of treatment on and off into intention to treat. And you're going to define now treatment dummy the first time your treatment turns on. Many of the solutions available in the different, different literature for on and off relies us on first translating things to first time treatment on and then playing around with this intention to treat, rescaling by how many periods I have been actually on. And that's the idea of the Charles Martin and Dufay paper that I had mentioned earlier. But here, let's abstract from that. And once it's on, it remains on because it's easier to explain the building blocks of the analysis. And to make things more concrete and less abstract, right? Let's work with a concrete empirical exercise, right? That is most likely familiar to many of you. It has to be the effect of the ACA Medicare expansion on health insurance rate, right? And we want to hear the target population of interest, right? So which is essentially the people who are subject to the expansion. We're going to look at people like who are low income, do not have kids. They are adults between 25 to 64. And we're gonna, the outcome of interest over here is going to be the health insurance rate among this population. And the reason is that we want to see if like the Medicaid expansion actually increase the health insurance rate or not, because we have seen some debates going on like, well, like Medicaid is only crowding out the health insurance market. So people who are private now is public. So in the end, there's no effect. Let's see what the data speaks about that in general. And again, it's not a matter of illustration. I would like to thank Andrew Goodman Baker for putting this data set together for us as well, right? I, I think two or three years ago, we had we gave a joint seminar, like, and this data was like used for that, and I'm still using it until today. So if we were, the idea is this, if we were back in 2014, right? The Medicaid expansion happens in around the first, the first wave of expansion happens in 2014. Right. And if you are in that year, right, we would have only two groups. We would going to have states who expanded Medicaid in 2014. And those states that as of 2014 have not yet expanded Medicaid. So as usual, good practice, I always recommend people to plot the average outcome of interest for these two groups in a plot like this. And if I have this plot, how can I assess the plausibility of my parallel trend assumption? Well, I'm going to look in pretreatment periods, right? So pretreatment periods, everything that happens from 2008 until 2013. So in this plot, these two groups have very similar treatment evolution, but actually they have very similar starting point as well. So parallel trends seems to be a plausible assumption looking at pretreatment trends in before treatment takes place. Of course, once Medicaid expanded in these states, I have a bump in insurance here. I also have a bump in the non-expansion states, but this bump is much less pronounced. But so the idea is like, if I have this type of data and I am in 2014, I'm able to run these regressions here, go back without much trouble because I have only two groups, right? And once I have, I do not have validation treatment timing. So this beta have a uh, somehow clear interpretation in that situation. But we are never that fast, right? In fact, we always want more data. We are social scientists. We like data. We are happy when they give us more data. And in 2015, what happens? Well, different states actually expanded Medicaid. So now like in 2015, I have three groups. I have those states who expanded Medicaid early on. In 2014, I have those who expanded Medicaid in 2015 and those who have not yet expanded Medicaid as of 2015. Now, this is a situation when the two, by, when the two groups analysis is not really applicable anymore because I have three groups now. I have, two, three, I have variation treatment time. And what I can do, again, we 
It's not the end. We never stop over there. As of 2019, right, I have several other groups. I have the very early expansions. Those who expanded in 2015, those who expanded in 2016, those who expanded in 2019, and those who as of 2019, when we prepare this data set, right, have not yet expanded. So looking at, this is a kind of typical situation that this type of true FXFX regressions have been used. I have like one, two, three, four, five groups, and I have 20 time periods, right? So I have multiple groups and multiple time periods. And if you are doing different, different analysis back in 2017, 2018, 2019 even, right? How would I answer? What is the effect of Medicaid on health insurance rate among its target population? Well, yeah. what I would do it, I would run this particular to a fixed effects regression, I would compute beta hat and I would interpret beta hat as a measure of causal effects, right? Andrew Goodman Bacon used to be my office neighbor. And I mean, we are, we are good friends and we talk, we discuss things. And I remember like back in the day, he knocked at my office, talk, 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 Pedro, I have this problem, right? I have this regression that I'm running, a two fixed effects regression. And I don't know what is beta. What is beta hat here? What kind of variation beta hat is actually leveraging? I'm, am I leveraging variation treatment timing? I'm actually, I'm, am I leveraging like only timing variation, treated versus untreated variation. What is going on over here? I remember looking at him and saying, Bacon, I don't, get, I don't follow. That it's very easy to compute beta hat. It's, it's econometrics 101 textbook message. All you have to do, it is apply the FWL theorem. That was exactly my answer. And he's like, well, what is, what is FWL? I said, well, all you have to do is this. You remove units means from the, the treatment dummy. After you have removed the unit means, you remove the means of this transform, the time, you, you remove the time component of this component as well. So you have this detailed transformation. And at the end of the day, all you have to do is to regress the outcome of interest against this transformed variable, and that's a beta hat, right? So beta hat is gonna be literally a univariate regression of the outcome of interest against this transformed like treatment variable. And he's like, yeah, I can see that, but who cares? There is no intuition in this. How, what is going on behind this beta hat here? I mean, what kind of variation it's actually leveraging? I know this is the mathematical interpretation, but it's still not very like informative what is going on behind the scenes with this beta. And for me, that's what makes his paper like extremely clear because he does not settle in the beta hat interpretation here on the mechanics, on the like kind of the mechanics mathematical formulation. He wants to dig deeper to better understand this beta hat such that he, can, uh, he and I, we can all explain this to people who are not experts on these procedures. How are we gonna do this? Let's do this, let's, let's follow his steps Right, to try to, lab, to, to interpret beta hat here in terms of the types of difference and difference analysis that can be run behind the scenes with this type of data. What I mean is this, instead of having six, seven groups, right? let's have a situation that I have only three groups. It's stylized, but it's gonna like, allow us to gain more intuition. And the idea is like, we're gonna have our early treated states, Think about the states who expanded Medicaid in 2014. I'm gonna have the late treated states, those expanded the Medicaid in 2019. And I'm gonna have the states who are quote unquote, never treated or who remain untreated until the end of my time period. With these three types of groups, we can already leverage the intuition about what 2 fixed effect is doing behind the scenes for us. Because if I give you these three data sets, you can start asking, what types of difference and difference analysis can I run with these three groups? The first one is like, well, I can drop the late treated group. So the, the, I can drop from my data set, those units were treated in 2019. Then I have a treated group, those were expanded Medicaid in 2014, and those quote unquote never treated, 
right? So I have this, I have two groups only. And once I have two groups only, what I can do, I can average all the post-treatment periods. I can average all the pre-treatment periods across these two groups. By averaging the post and average the pre, I'm back to the two by two case. I have average pre, average post, two groups. So I essentially am back to the two by two. And I can do diff and diff here with a very clear interpretation. So this will be no problem, easy to explain. What other type of diff and diff I can do? Well, I can drop the early treated, and now I'm gonna do late treated versus never treated, right? The dashed black line here is a group that remains untreated in the whole panel, right? Then what I can do, I can follow the same procedure. I'm gonna average all pre-treatment periods across these two different groups separately. I have only one post-treatment period here, so I don't have to average. And again, I am back to the two by two case. So there's a two, type of diff and diff that is to run valid. There is a third one we can also do. We can compare early treated versus later treated, right? And in time periods that the later treated remains untreated. So what it means, I'm gonna have data from 2008 until 2018, because in 2019, the later, the later treated group is gonna be treated. And I want these units in a time window which they remain untreated the longest. So dropping data from 2019, right? I'm gonna have compared treated group, early treated versus later treated, right? And again, I can do the same. I can average treatment timing. I can average pre-treatment periods. I can average post-treatment periods separately. And this is a valid diff and diff. All these three types of diff and diff is always comparing a treated group, right, versus an untreated group, right? So the comparison group here, the control group, is always remain untreated in the whole time period that are analyzing the data. And that's the key for us because we are comparing treated versus untreated, right? That's what diff and diff is all about. We try to impute the untreated potential outcomes based on parallel to making parallel trend assumptions. And that's the key component to do that reliably over here. Unfortunately, there is a fourth type of diff and diff that I can actually run in this particular specification, right? Which is from 2014 until 2019, right? The early treated group has treatment status always on. So because treatment status is always on for this set of units, they can serve as a quote unquote control group for the later treated. Because what I can do here, I can compare like eventually treated versus already treated. And that's a different type of diff and diff that you can actually compute. I'm not telling that you should compute, but it mean, but in principle you could, because treatment status is constant for the black line for the early treated, and treatment status is changing for the other units. And my friends, this is where things go south because two way fixed effects at the end of the day, it is variational hungry. What I mean by variational hungry? When you compute this beta hat using two way fixed effects regression, OLS is gonna, com gonna compute these four different types of diff and diff, right? Three of these types are very good. The first three are thumbs up, very good, desirable, very clean. This last one, in which I'm using already treated units as a control group for eventually treated units is gonna be the source of headache, the source of nightmares for all of us. Because parallel trends does not, the one that we are making does not allow us to do this comparison because the control group here is always treated and parallel trends is all about untreated potential outcomes. And OLS couldn't care less. OLS is about minimizing mean square errors, right? Gaining precision, exploiting all the variation in the data such that I can get a precise answer. We are doing causal inference. Because we are doing causal inference, we are, you are variational cautious. And because you are variational cautious, we do not want to exploit all the variation in the data. You want to exploit the quote unquote good variation in the data. So there is a misalignment between us doing causal inference and OLS being variational hungry. 
And that's the source of the problems. At this stage, what the main result of the paper by Andrew Goodman Baker it is to be, it's kind of like quote unquote, causal inference agnostic. It is telling us, you may not like this, but that's exactly what, what two fixed effects is doing it. Two fixed effect is exploiting all these four different types of different diff, right? Using these different windows, and it's going to attach weights to each of these four types of different diff, right? So again, each of these betas has that I have here. Pedro, yes. before we go on, can we? Can I? I'm going to clear up a couple Absolutely. of questions that I think are relevant to the last section. Um, sorry to interrupt you. <laughs> so I'm going to I'm going to handle these out of order. So. We've got one question that says, do you always need at least one unit that remains untreated for the whole window? Um, to clarify, if at any given time, if one group is untreated, but it's not always the same group, um, there isn't one specific group that's always untreated, is that a problem? So for a given window of interest, you always have to have a group of units who remains untreated in that given window, right? So it doesn't have to be the same group. So if I have variation treatment timing, Right, that group can be changing over time, but I do have to have units who are untreated in every single time period. If I have a time window in where everybody's treated, I cannot apply difference and difference in that window using the assumption we have in making it. We're going to have to trim that data out. Got it. Um, what happens if there's a lag in your outcome from time of treatment? And there are also time varying covariates with potential temporal autocorrelation in the outcomes. So time varying covariates, it's the complication of all different diff. Because time varying covariates can potentially be affected by treatment policy, directly or indirectly. Think about this. I raise minimum wage. Because I raise minimum wage, I have an inflow of workers across the border, which change the population of interest in the treated state. So that's, in that case, the composition of the population, the treated state, change because of the policy. And, and conditioning on that, it's a, a bad control. It's a collider, right? So you don't want to do that. So if you want to have, if you want to include time varying covariates in your different and different analysis, you have to either guarantee it is not affected by the policy, or you have to modify the difference in difference methods that allows for that type of things. So treatment, so that's the first complication. Treatment taking some time to the effects to take up, that's not a problem. Here, we are not, rest I mean, in general, difference and difference does not restrict the time until treatment actually kicks in because the analysis is fully non-parametric in treatment dynamics. That is the case when I do not have on and off. I say when treatment is staggered, it's on and remains on, I allow, we allow for arbitrary treatment effect dynamics, meaning it may take two, three years for the effect to, to feel, then it actually feels. And this is something that, that's a situation, for example, minimum wage, right? And when you raise minimum wage state, minimum state, minimum wage, sometimes it takes time for the local economy to adjust. So it takes one, two years, like one year at least, like for the effect to kick in. Okay, great. So then and we'll just do one last question and I'll let you move on. Um, this goes back to the beta waiting. Um, this is a follow-up on an earlier question from about an hour ago about the heterogeneity across units. So this person asks, do we need to wait beta? It, sorry, do we need to wait beta if we only have heterogeneity across treated units without dynamic treatment? So if there is no dynamics, this weight's gonna average, I mean, the weight's gonna simplify a lot, right? So that in the paper, Goodman Baker show if there is no dynamics whatsoever, so it's a jump and it stays constant. I mean, the negative weighting problem goes away. That is an aggregation of weights, right? But, but you don't see negative weights anymore. So the worst problem goes away, but it's still gonna have these weights depend on the variance that I'm gonna talk in a minute. And then it's, it's, you have to decide if you like various weights or if you do not like various weights. Great. Okay, so there's one more here, but let's go ahead and move on. And we'll, we'll try to get to these later if we can. Thank you. Perfect, yes. So the idea here of the Goodman Bacon decomposition or the Bacon decomposition, it is that when you run OLS 
and you run to a fixed effects regression, right? While you're computing, it is a weighted sum of four different types of diff and diff, right? One is like early versus never, later, late versus never, like early versus later in a window when the later is untreated. And then you have like already treated, like later versus already treated, which is the source of many of the problems. We're going to call this last type of diff and diff here, the forbidden comparison. And that's a terminology coined by Borussia Chiravel and Spears, right? To highlight that this is not warranted in diff and diff analysis in general. But we don't care. I mean, OLS doesn't care about that. It is still computes. So you're going to have four different types of diff and diff, and each of them is going to be weighted by these weights, right? Why does these weights come from? They're going to depend on, because I'm, we are subsampling the data in each of these analysis, one component that's going to come up is the relative sample size that remains in the data, right? So if I do not, if I keep a lot of my data in this particular window, these weights are higher. If I drop a lot of the units in some of these windows, the weights are smaller, right? So relative sample size matters for these weights, which is very intuitive. The second thing is about these various weights, right? So the second component of these weights, it is stressing that the position of treatment timing within this window matters, right? So if I have treatment in these windows that happens in this middle of my sample, I'm going to give you more weights. If the treatment happens in the extreme of the samples, I'm going to give you less weights, right? And this, for me, it's where things get complicated because where, why the treatment, like the relative position of treatment timing matters for my weights. And why this is problematic, in my view, I'm gonna give an example. Very often, we're gonna do robustness checks, right? And when I do robustness checks, you say, I'm gonna drop some pre-treatment periods. I'm gonna, I'm gonna drop some post-treatment periods. And I'm gonna report in different columns, regressions when I drop this different type of like subsamples. Every time I include or exclude data for my analysis, these weights are changing. So this means that like in general, when you compare coefficients across these columns, we are not comparing apples to apples because their weights are changing, right? And I do not like that. An alternative situation like, well, I am very good. I'm gonna give it to you, like because I'm Santa Claus, I'm gonna give you like 10 more periods of pre-treatment data incorporate that data. And as soon as you incorporate that data, it can change everything in your analysis. And that's a component that comes from these various weights, right? Because it's related to the variance of this transform D tilde. Again, you don't have to like this. You have to accept this because that's what OLS is doing it. That's what Sway Fix Effects Regression is doing it, right? And that's where the, the Goodman Bacon paper really shines because it's clarifying like what's going on behind the scenes. Now that we know all this, we have to ask our, ourselves, right? Uh, we have to ask ourselves, right? Is this what I want, right? Is this something that is reasonable? Am I willing to use these weights? Can I pick other weights, right? Should I use all these types of difference and differences analysis or I should only use the first three, not the fourth? These are things that we, we should ask ourselves what we want and how we move forward. Everything that I have said, so the, the, the Baker decomposition results goes more generally. So I have three groups only in the illustrated example. In the paper, he shows how to generalize that for an arbitrary number of groups. What I do want to call the attention of everybody here, it is that the Bacon weights, right, are always non-negative. There is no way you can get negative weights using the Bacon decomposition because all these weights depend on sample size squared and variances. This cannot be negative, right? So that's the first component because the Bacon decomposition is kind of like quote unquote mechanical. What it's doing here is showing us what OLS is doing it. Now, negative weights gonna come when we want to attach a causal interpretation to this beta because we're gonna flip, let me just show you. This last type of diff and diff, we will flip it, 
right? Because we're going to use our ready treated units as a treated group, and the other group is. So we're going to reverse the whole role of treated and control. And how are you going to do that? Putting a minus in front of it, right? That's how negative weights going to come up in a minute. But when you do the Baker decomposition in Stata or in R or you name the software, the weights always come up positive. We should pay attention to this last component here, the weights that use our treated units as a comparison group. That's going to give us a hint of how problematic negative weights can be. So again, all this theoretical, but what does this mean for two-way fixed effects regression, right? What is the takeaway message from these results? In our application, right, for this ACA expansion, the beta hat is equal to 0 0.074. So I go there, I run that regression. Like in R, I get the beta hat of 0 0.74, 0 points, essentially. I raise in seven percentage points, right? OLS when I use sample size and variance as weights. And is that what you want? Are these policy relevant ways of aggregating heterogeneity? We have to answer those questions. And two way fixed effects is try, exploit all types of like two by two different diff in the analysis. We're gonna do treated versus never treated, early treated versus later treated, and also later treated versus already treated. This last component here is I'm not willing to go there and actually use it, but OLS does not really care, right? So this is going to be the source of our handex into a fixed effects regression. So does this mean, again, if the weights I attach to this last cohort here are minimal, right? Then there's not much problem. If the weights I attach to this last comparison here are higher, negative weights become a real deal. So let's show this like in a classical plot a la Bacon, right? About in our application of the ACA Medicaid expansion, what it means. So first, I can compare treated units, so states who have raised the ACA, like the, who expanded the ACA versus the state that as of 2019 had not raised the ACA just yet. I have several types of diff and diff over there, right? My, remember, this is the beta hat that I get for all the analysis. Only doing treated versus never treated, I get a coefficient that's 75.075, and the weight attached to it is 86%. So this is a high weight attached to this, like, treated versus never treated, not never treated. What about the other ones? What about expansions, uh, early expanders versus later expanders? Right, so this is, again, the, the second type of variation, which is only leveraging treatment timing as a sort of variation. If I do that, the coefficient is like 0.08, and the weight's around 10%. So the sum of these two weights are around 96%, right? What about the forbidden comparison? The forbidden comparison in this application is around 4% of the weights only, and it's the coefficient is substantially smaller. It's 0.027, right? So this means that in this particular application, right, these forbidden comparisons, very likely not going to give any issues of negative weights, right? However, how do I, why we are aggregating these different ATTs in this particular way is because OLS is trying to minimize mean square error, it's being variational hungry. So the main takeaway message from this Baker decomposition, it is that in general, two-way fixed effects will not recover and easy to, interpret, easy to interpret color parameter of interest unless we rule out heterogeneity in dynamics. The reason is that it's not easy to interpret because those weights do not have a very clear interpretation. And if I have heterogeneity in dynamics, right, these weights go to induce some negative weights in terms, of causal, in terms of ATTs. I know there is a big jump here. So the question is like, yeah, Fine, there's a big jump. How do you all know this? Pedro, you're a magician. How do you go for the bacon weight? They're always positive. You claim that is, you can interpret this. How do you know all that? Right? And this is a good transition slide to show that to map all these results from bacon to other work for alternative decompositions available in the literature. 
as I mentioned several times, the bacon weights are kind of like mechanical. That's what OLS is doing it. We have not imposed parallel trends, no anticipation, and sort of assumptions behind the scenes. So that's all what mechanics. Now, we're only doing this type of two-way fixed effects regression, difference and differences, because we care about causal effects. So what is not for us to do? Well, once I have seen what is going on in the data, in the mechanics, let me attach additional causal assumptions and see what kind of causal parameter this beta hat is actually estimating. So Bacon had a whole section in his paper that he deals with that, right? But also other papers have that built in from the very beginning. For example, the Charles Martin and Dufay in their AR 2020 paper, that's how they start. So well, we're gonna make parallel trend assumptions from the very beginning. We're gonna impose no anticipation, right? And you wanna see what kind of causal parameter beta is recovering. So I want to spend some time giving you the dynamics of the, the discussion of this the French decomposition, right? Because this is gonna be helpful for you to understand where negative weights are coming from. If the weights from Bakers are always positive, how do we jump from positive weights to negative weights is somehow confusing. The French decomposition help us spinning that down more clearly. So some Sorry, remarks. I think we have a, yes. I mean, let me ask two real quick questions. I hope they're quick Absolutely. before we move on. Um, First one, are these weights arbitrary or is there a theoretical intuition to the weight assignment? So the weights, I mean, they're not, I don't know, let's put it this way. They are, arbitra they are not arbitrary because they are driven by the estimation methods, right? Essentially what OLS is trying to do, it is to try to minimize mean square error. When you try to minimize mean square error, you're willing to, like, there is a bias and a various component. So OLS is trying to, call, like, to balance these two forces. To do that, sometimes OLS extrapolate from one group to another. There is some extrapolations that are not really desirable if you care about causal effects. And that's what gives these weights. If treatment effects are homogeneous, there is no heterogeneity, it's homogeneous, and you have no autocorrelation, those weights and homoscalicity, those weights give you the best linear regression possible. What is like Gauss Markov all back. So, in a world where the heterogeneity does not play a big role, right, those weights give you the best, like, best weights possible in terms of precision. The price you pay that if you have heterogeneity, those weights can distort things a lot. And then the last one, um, this may be this may be addressed in your slides, I think on page 46 and 47, but you can correct me if I'm wrong. How are the weights for the decompositions calculated? Yes, so that's essentially like this. Yes, in slide 47, we have this particular formula. It's relative sample size, right? And so NQ is like the proportion of the, the units who remains in the sample. And this D bar is the average Defined in the previous slide. So that's exactly the formula for those weights. You can, I mean, you can easily compute this. There is software to compute this as well for you. Right? In the state, I think it's Bacon Decomp, right? And we're going to see in a couple of minutes an exercise how you can compute all these weights. Good. So let me talk about the French decomposition or the French weights. Here, before I go into that, I have to make some remarks, but right? The first remark is that in their paper, they allow for Titan to turn on and turn off, and they allow more general sampling, like distribution schemes, then I'm making it here. But for the sake of simplicity and to like, to avoid more cumbersome notation, I'm adding a structure to their paper, right? I'm adding more structure, ruling, I mean, I'm first I'm ruling out to turn on and turn off, I'm making simplifications, and that's going to allow me to streamline notation. So if you see what I'm talking here today in, the, in these slides, and you see in their paper the notation mismatch, it is because I am making stronger assumptions they are making the paper, right? So but on the other hand, I mean, I think we can get a lot of intuition from the simplified notation, right? At least from my personal point of view, but I understand what is going on. So this is just to simplify exposition. So if you see mismatching formulas, it's because I am the one making stronger assumptions over here. 
So to talk about the negative weights or the, the French weights, they, I mean, the building blocks of the analysis, they are different. So the building block of the Baker decomposition analysis, it is this two by two different diff, time average different diff, right? Which is as crucial to get the decomposition over there. The building block of the French decomposition is gonna be unit specific frequent effects. So I'm gonna define this delta ITG. This is the unit, the unit in time specific causal effect of being first exposed to treatment in time G versus never being exposed to treatment. Right, so this is gonna be the building block of analysis. Then in order to define the weights, I'm gonna to have to define some residuals for an auxiliary regression. So think about this DIT here to be written as some unit specific components, time specific components, and everything else that is not unit specific or time specific is the error, right? So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna get this error term, right? The weights is gonna be the error terms divided by the sum of the error terms across i and t such that dit is equals to one. So among the, among the units and time periods in which treatment is on, average these epsilon it's, right? And you have this like, n one is the, is the sum of these guys here. So this is gonna be the notion of the weights, this wit, which is come from these residuals here. Finally, we also want to make parallel trend assumptions because here we are interested in causal interpretation from the very beginning. To make things the simplest, we're going to make the strongest notion of parallel trends that we can come up with. So parallel trends here holds for every group and for every time period. It's not only for post time period, it's for post and pre, and it's across every single group, right? And I'm making this assumption, I mean, if I make strong assumptions here and, I, and we show bad results, we can think about even in the best case scenarios, when our assumptions are very strong, we don't get what you want, then it's reasonable to expect that if you relax assumptions, you're gonna get weird stuff as well. So I'm gonna call this strong unconditional parallel trends because parallel trends holds now across groups and across all time periods before and after it takes place. Then we have this beautiful result, the French decomposition, who shows that under Sutva, no anticipation, and the strong parallel trends, right? The beta coefficient of the straight fixed effects regression of progressing the outcome of interest for unit I and period T against time, unit fixed effects, time fixed effects, and this treatment dummy, right? It follows that I can write this beta as a weighted average of of the expectation of a weighted average of this unit specific treatment effects where these Ws here can be negative. So these weights can be negative. And the, the intuition is very clear if you exploit the results for Bacon. Why these weights can be negative? These weights can be negative because we are using already treated units as a control group for eventually treated units, and that should not be allowed, right? That kind of forbidden comparison gives birth of these negative weights in which the French paper, the French composition made explicitly about this, right? So this, this forbidden comparison, again, a term coined by Borussia Jacques and Jarvel, right? It's the source of the problems. So how do I know that of the problem? We can map one decomposition into the other and see like if you do not have that bad comparison group, right? The forbidden comparison, negative weights do not happen. So I go in the software, we're gonna, we're gonna see this in a minute. I run this decomposition in practice, right? And in, a, in our application, we do not have negative weights, right? So this is, this is not surprising. This is expected because most of the states in our, in our application who got treated, got treated in 2014. And our never treated group is highly stable and is very large. So many people in the literature 
say, well, because I do not have negative weights, I'm going to keep using 2A fixed effects regression. I understand our desire to stick to tools that we have been using for many years. But does that mean that this is that it works? That I mean, negative weights, in my view, it is just one of the problems. Of course, this is the worst problem you can have. But interpretability and policy relevance in a world when I have heterogeneity is also important. And to talk about like policy relevance, the weights play a big role. And we have to be careful if we care about these weights, right? Because not being able to attach a proper interpretation to the weights can hide a lot of action, right? So the fact that I mean, if you do not find negative weights, right, it's a good sign, but it, it does not necessarily mean that we should keep using two way fixed effects as our main tool, because if you care about heterogeneity, there are alternative ways of tackling this problem. So, yeah, questions. I think the, the, we've got a few here, but I, I, I think they're a little bit too, like, for various reasons, I think we should move, move forward. Um, yeah, no, but yeah, perfect, I'm, yes. I'm keeping these here. So in case we'll get time to um, get to them later. Now, thanks, Paul. Appreciate it. Yep. So oh, hold, hold on one second. I'm sorry. There's, there yeah. is one that just came in. If the estimate from the good comparisons are close, like in the example you showed, then the weights aren't mattering too much. Is this correct? Yes, that's correct. That is definitely correct, right? So that's the, I mean, if it, that means there is not enough heterogeneity, right? We're going to show in a minute that the, the heterogeneity robust tools applied to our example are going to give very similar, like, answers. However, right, if I, I mean, let's put it this way, let me go back, because I like this question a lot. If I do drop the never treated units on the data, right? Because think about the Medicaid example. Are you really saying that, I don't know, like Missouri is a good comparison for California? I mean, it may not be like states who never raise minimum wage, then never expand Medicaid, right? May not be good comparison states for states who actually expand Medicaid. So if you want to be more careful on who, who you're going to use as a comparison group or not, and you're afraid that never treated are bad comparison for everybody else, you want to, you want to exploit variation treatment timing as a sub variation, then you do have negative weights and then the results change a lot. So that's the situation. We're going to illustrate this in, in a minute as well. If you drop the never treated, things do change. So I like these plots a lot because it gives us these different weights, right? I mean, I have these different types of weights, right? I mean, and I can compare them. So it's a, it's a kind of like a way to see how they get together. But each of these, but each of these diff and diff here, right? Each of these coefficients, they are already aggregated. So these are these components here, this aggregated this way, this way, and that way, right? So I mean, there's already some various weights going on over there. But you can see how much heterogeneity you have depending on the position of these axes and, and dots, right? Because these are the, actually each of these two by two plot around the, the corner. Um, one more quick one, I hope. Um, this says, what is the problem with negative weights? <laughs> so yeah, the problem with negative weights is the following. I mean, suppose treatment effect is positive for everybody. Right? I mean, me, Brady, Paul, Frank, all of us benefit from the policy. But we benefit from the policy in a different way because we are all we have different backgrounds, we have different like perspectives. If it, once we aggregate the effect among the four of us, and if there is some negative weights, it is possible that once we aggregate, even though every, the effect of everybody here is positive, the aggregation is negative. Right, because negative weights do not restrict the effects to being this convex hole, right? So it's a non-convex average. And if I have, if the effect is positive for everybody, and I still give you a beta that is negative, 
I mean, I'm giving you conflict. I mean, I'm, I'm giving you like mistaken recommendations. I say triple effects positive. I spit up a negative beta. Say, wait a minute, it makes no sense. I mean, if, if, if the effect is negative, I should shut down the policy. But the effect is positive, so I should expand the policy. And that's what you do not want. You do not want to like have these conflicts. So negative weight is the biggest thing in this, like, in this world. So yeah, moving forward, like dynamics came up several times in the discussion. And it, it is true. If I do not have triple effect dynamics, right, negative weights in general are not going to happen. That's a result showing the Bacon paper. But if I, what about if I do have triple effect dynamics, right? Well, if I do have triple effect dynamics, what should I do? Perhaps I'm just going to go ahead and model the dynamics, right? How I'm going to model the dynamics? I'm going to rely on a so-called 2A fixed effects specification that is doing an event study. So event study. It's a fancy word to say, instead of running that simple, static, to a fixed effects regression of the outcome of interest against unit-specific fixed effects, time-specific fixed effects, and this DIT dummy, I'm going to now replace the, the treatment dummy, which takes value one if you're treated zero otherwise, with a bunch of treatment leads and treatment legs. So treatment legs, when I have this index k here, going from zero until L, and these dummy variables indicated treatment legs, it is essentially doing the following. I'm going to go at you, your unit I. I'm going to go at you and say, well, unit I, today's period T, are you going to be treated today? Or is today the first time you're treated? If the answer is yes, then D zero IT takes value one. If the answer is no, takes value zero. What about K equals to one? I'm gonna ask, is today one period after you start your treatment? If the answer is yes, takes value one. If the answer is no, takes value zero. When K equals to two, I ask, is today time period T two days after you start treatment? If the answer is yes, takes value one. If the answer is no, takes value zero. I can do this for several legs, right? And I can also do this reverse. When the K is negative, I'm gonna call this treatment leads. And I'm gonna ask, today, are they gonna be treated in two days from today? That's when K is equals to minus two. If the answer is yes, takes value one. If the answer is no, takes value zero. So are they gonna be treated in three days from today? Yes, takes value one. No, takes value zero. So I'm omitting the minus one for this regression over for this leads because I'm pinning down a reference point. The reference point is going to be the time just before treatment starts point, starting point. So I can add a bunch of leads. I'm going to say I'm going to I'm going to add up to minus k. I'm going to add a bunch of legs, right? And sometimes you say, well, I don't want to have a fully saturated regression. There are too many coefficients, so I want to I want to bin the endpoints. So this d, like bigger than l, is a dummy variable that takes value one if I am more than l periods ahead of treatment, and minus k is the analogous if I want to be the treatment leads before. That's the idea of this event study specification. And in this regression, right, the gamma k legs here are supposed to capture how treatment effects evolve over time. So gamma k lens are supposed to say, well, I want to see how treatment effects evolve with time since treatment started. So this is supposed to capture treatment effect dynamics. And gamma k leads, these orange coefficients, they're supposed to capture potential violations of parallel trends and potential violations of the non dissipation assumption. So ideally, if that is the case, all these gamma k leads should be close to zero. And Gamma K labs are supposed to capture treatment effect heterogeneity. This is what is called a true event study specification, right? And this is very popular in the literature. So the question is well, we have seen that a static two way fixed effects regression does not work when I have variation treatment and time and dynamics. Now, what happens if I do this event study 
a specification with variation of return time. Does this actually work? And why do, why do we care about this question? If I do the event study plot for the Medicaid expansion, right? This is what I get, right? So remember, you guys ask me, oh, are you gonna talk about pre-test about parallel trends, right? This is one way to assess how people have assessed the plausibility of parallel trend assumptions in applications. So the coefficients here from zero onwards at the gamma, the gamma legs, and they're supposed to capture turpent effect dynamics. So you see, once you expand Medicaid, like the health insurance rate jumps around five percentage points, right, among the turpent states, and then it keeps grow, grows a little bit further in, in one period ahead, two periods ahead, then it's stabilized after two periods. This is supposed to capture the evolution of treatment effects among treated states. What about the gamma K leads here? If they are doing what you're supposed to do, all these coefficients should be close to zero, right? And if they are all close to zero, it means our assumptions are plausible, at least in pre-treatment periods. In this example, things are fairly close to zero, right? I mean, so we believe this is the reasonable approximation for the parallel trends. If the met is doing what it's supposed to do. So if this is what is going on, if this is what's supposed to mean. So we care about if the method works because the underlying goal here is like, should we trust this type of plots? And these are very important questions, right? And this is where the paper by Sun and Abraham comes to birth and shine, right? Because the, the idea of the paper by Sun and Abraham is, is to tackle exactly this question. When you run these two rate fixed effects regressions in an event study setup, what is going on behind the scenes, right? What kind of comparisons we are making it? And you can guess, right? Parallel trends is again, like the Sun and Abraham, they are bringing again, bad news for two-way fixed effects, right? And the, the, the main conclusion of their paper, and one of the main conclusions of their paper is that even when we have strong parallel trends, like parallel trends holds for every groups across all time periods, even then, we have some kind of contamination effects across coefficients. And what does it mean to have contamination effects across coefficients? It means that the coefficient here at zero cannot be interpreted as an instantaneous return effect. The coefficient here at one cannot be interpreted as an average return effect one period after you treat it. Because some of the effects, one is the effects here across different event times contaminate one another. Even worse, the contamination does not go only for treated periods, it also extrapolates for untreated periods. So if I, I mean, so relying on this pre-treatment coefficients over here, the treatment leads to assess the plausibility of our assumptions, it is not guaranteed to work, right? Essentially, pre-trends can solely appear if I do have treatment effect heterogeneity. So if I have heterogeneous dynamics, I can find violation of pre-trends only because of contamination. And again, this is a word of caution that you should be very careful to use event study specifications if you want to embrace heterogeneity from the very beginning in setups when we do have variation treatment timing. I'm gonna stop here. I'm gonna have an illustration of this with simulated data to show this, how this actually happens. But before I jump into that, it's a great place to stop to see if anybody has any conceptual questions. Paul, I'd suggest that we touch on maybe a couple of the um, earlier questions if we can. Yes, perfect, yes. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm, yeah, go, go, go for it. Well, I'm, I'm a little worried we're gonna run out of time. So I had just kind of chatted that we would hold these till the end actually, but um, if you think we're good on time, we can take some here, what do you think? Yeah, we can take two questions here. Okay. okay, so I'll, I'll just kind of start from the top. And my apologies, everybody. I'm just kind of letting these go, but we'll get to these if we have time. So the top one says, can you have units that move back and forth, treated for some time periods, and then not treated in others, i.e. policy is rejected in the state after some time? Is this, is this possible? Can, yeah, it's possible. It's going to be in the situation when treatment turns on and turn off, right? Uh, we all, I mean, in general, when treatment turn on and turn off, this negative weights become more prominent. Right, and all of this is discussed in more detail in this paper by the Shaz Martin and Dufel. Right, they are the source that you should go 
take a look on how to do it. Great. And then let's let's just do one more, I guess. Um, can you have you? I'm oh, sorry, I just answered that one. Um, will there will there always be four decomposed DID methods, or is it, or is the number of decompositions can this number vary depending on the specific question in hand? So it, I mean, the four depend. The answer is depending on the building block of the analysis. The building block for Bacon was this time average, like two by two, eighty different diff coefficients. In that setup, those are the four that you can have, right? So, but if you, I mean, in the French decomposition, for example, you have many more building blocks because, the, I mean, many more the weights because the, the building block of his, of their analysis, it is this unit specific treatment effect. So depending on the building block of your representation, you're gonna have different building blocks. And let, let's just do one more before we move on. This one's, I think, topical. Um, it says, would you mind clarifying more about OLS coefficients um, can still be contaminated by treatment effects from the excluded periods in the event study? This is, this is something that you had mentioned earlier. I just, this yes. is asking for clarification. Let me show this in a simulated example because this is a great hook for me to keep going, right? Because I understand this, this, this kind of the way it sounds, it's kind of like tricky. So the way I, I want to illustrate how this can actually happen Let's see this like very stylized example using simulated data. So here, I mean, again, like this is very stylized and I'm gonna have four different treatment groups. I have the group red who is exposed to treatment in period 86, group blue who is exposed to treatment for the first time in 92, green who is first treated in 98 and purple who is first treated in period 2004. And once, before treatment takes place, everything is very parallel. So parallel, I mean, I cook up this DGP, right? So parallel trends holds everywhere here, right? And you can clearly see from plotting the data, here is like, well, before treatment takes place, everything is parallel over here. Like among units who remain untreated, parallel trend also remains here. Same is true over here. So we do have parallel trends everywhere in this application. We do have dynamics and we do have heterogeneous dynamics. So the group red and the group purple have steeper dynamics than the group blue and the group green. Right? So I have early treated and very late treated with very steep like dynamics and the people in between, which is low, they still grow, but it's growing in a lower rate. So once I plot these things, what it shouts out here to me is like, oh, this is the perfect word for doing diff and diff because parallel trends is very plausible. And this is just to, to keep me honest, all the, the DGP specified over here, right? So just to make sure that I, I, we, I'm not cheating. So what I'm gonna do, I wanna generate data following that type of specification in the picture. I wanna do this like 1000 times. And what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna regress the outcome of interest against unit fixed effects, time fixed effects, I'm gonna have treatment leads and treatment legs, right? Again, all my assumptions here are valid. I have part of trends, I have not a special, I have everything. I will be my end points here at five because I only care about treatment effects five periods before treatment takes place and five periods after. I'll do this 1000 times and I'll report the average and the simulated standard error. When I do this, this is what I get, right? So the, the red curve is what it's, I'm supposed to get right? But the contamination effects from treatment lead to treatment legs, right? Because I have heterogeneous dynamics, this is, what, this is literally what I get. So first, when I look at pre-treatment periods, right, this blue curve, it is definitely non-zero. And I mean, how this is possible, right? My, all my assumptions are valid. They're supposed to be L equals to zero. And these guys here are non-zero because there is some like contamination effect from post to pre, right? And that's like essentially this mess up my specification. And what about post treatment periods? They also bias downwards, right? Again, because of contamination. So there was somebody asking me, like asking just before, like why negative weights is, is so bad. This is a situation where treatment effect is positive for everybody. So once I am treated, my outcome grows. 
grows, grows, grows. But once I do this, if I do the static two way fixed FX regression, I have a negative coefficient. So this sign flip, it is like a no go to everyone. This is like, you don't want that. That's what I mean by a contamination effect. Like this, specific, this is all coming from this result from Summer and Abraham, showing that when I have dynamics and these dynamics are heterogeneous, this specification can give you weird results. And if, I, if, if anyone sees pretreatment trends like this here in the blue component, right? This is immediately gonna show, oh, my assumptions are all violated. I should choose a different method. I'm gonna add unit specific trends. I'm gonna do a different method. I'm gonna use synthetic control. When in fact, this is not a problem. All my assumptions are valid. This is only happening because uh, the method is not respecting my assumptions. There is some contamination bias going on overall here. And I look at me and say, ah, Pedro, you're, you, this is not true. This is all coming from the fact you have been these endpoints, right? I've been like minus five and five. What if you add all possible treatment links and treatment legs? And after you add everything, you only want to report what you care. In this particular specification, the problem gets even worse. If I do not be, I'm going to have all my coefficients on this event study to a fixed effects regression be negative and very negative, where in fact, everything is positive in my data, right? So this is a way to like to highlight that when you're doing differences and differences, you should not equate differences and differences with two way fixed effects regression because these are different things. Two way fixed effects are in general like estimation methods that is can and or cannot be used in different diff setups. When we have variation treatment timing, right? There are many situations when two way fixed effects are not the right tool for the job. And if two way fixed effects are not the right tool for the job, is there any hope? What should we do? And this is where like many new papers who embrace heterogeneity from the very beginning, like try to do. They say, well, we don't have to do, we don't have to rely on regression techniques. We can be very careful with the comparisons we want to make. We can actually do these comparisons by hand, one by one, and glue them together. And that's one of the main components of Callaway's antenna proposal, right? Which we're going to talk in a minute, which I mean, in this, in this situation, we hit exactly square the target. If you use the last treated cohort, this is also similar to San Abraham solution. And if you want to use all units who have not yet ex like, ex been exposed to treatment as a comparison group, right? So everybody who remains untreated in a given point in time, you also hit the target like very well. So this is to show that the pro there, is, I mean, there are tools out there who embrace heterogeneity, who embrace dynamics, and do not suffer from these problems of two fixed effects regression, right? So to, just to close this, this slide on the problem of two fixed effects regression, this is happening because OLS is variational hungry, but causal inference is variational cautious. We want to leverage the good variation in the data, right? We want to be very careful on who we are compared to who. And how we decide that? This is going to depend on our underlying assumptions. Once we make sure that our estimation method is respecting our assumptions, right? We can actually move ahead and build on that, right? So that's essentially like Callaway and Santana. It's one of the tools who propose how to do this, right? We are not the only game in town, right? There are many other papers who propose how to solve these issues as well. And in these slides, I have a summary of several of these papers, right? That you guys can read in your own time between the difference between Callaway and Santana and all their approach in the literature. The main takeaway of, I mean, I have one, two, uh, two slides about this discussion. I'm not going to have time to go into detail because we have only 44, 45 minutes more. But the main takeaway is that all the solutions, conceptually, they're similar. They, wanna, they only want to use clean comparison groups that respect our assumptions, right? Which one are you going to, what is a clean control group? This depends of your assumptions, and that's how these methods vary across each other. 
right? A summary of these differences is presented in slide 77 and 78, right? There are pros and cons for different of them, and I'll leave it right there. So the main takeaway is that very easy to avoid these problems. All we have to do it is to break this complicated task of like summarizing heterogeneity and doing like assumptions and all that to smaller tasks. They are more manageable. I usually, I usually call this like split the job, the big job into three smaller jobs. It's a divide and conquer type of procedure. We're gonna first talk about identification, then how we can glue these pieces together, then later on, how we can do estimation and inference. So I'm gonna focus on color in some time and what follows, right? But I think it's a good to give like a three minutes break now. So I will just will catch our breath and then go over the solutions. How do you think about that, Paul? I think we are good on timing. Okay, yeah, if you say so. I, I'm a little bit worried that we're gonna run out myself, <laughs> to be honest, but if, no. you, if you think we're good, we're good. I, I think this part is gonna be, I mean, this is the part that I'm very comfortable because I okay. have given this part very often, so yeah. Sure. Three minutes and you're back in three. Sounds good, so let's come back at 1220. Thank you, everybody.